Hi, I'm Peggy Farron. Welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Kevin Holliday is my guest today, and he is a really interesting character. His goal is to be a fine art photographer, and we're talking fine art, not you know, low end, bottom of the barrel art. So we're going to talk a little bit about selling your art, but not a lot. We're mostly going to talk about minimalism today. Um, his and Kevin's photographs are just very ethereal, very soft, very, I don't know, minimalist. That, I guess that's the right word for it. So he's going to go into um, vision and feelings, but also into technically how he puts his pictures together and things like that. If you're not on our mailing list, please subscribe. All you have to do is go to understandphotography.com and you'll see something right on the front page that says click here for freebies. If you sign up for any of our free offers, um, you'll be on our mailing list. So we um, actually, and I'm either going to, the newsletter is going to be out right around right now because this is going to come out on November 1st, I believe. Um, but we're going to do something special for Black Friday, Cyber Monday. We haven't fully developed it yet, but make sure you're on the newsletter list so you find out what it is. <laughs> um, we also have, you know, the Everglades trips in January. We have a couple of openings on one of them, and I think we have two openings actually on each of them. One of them is January 16th, I believe, and the other one is January 30th. So it's four days in the Everglades with Joe Fitzpatrick. Joe's been doing this tour for a long time. The trips normally sell out. So, you know, hop on it, hop on, hop on it. It's an amazing trip. We are one of, I think, only two photography companies who are actually permitted to go into Everglades National Park. And Everglades National Park is huge. So I'm sure there are other people who are doing it. They're just, you know, it's a felony, okay? <laughs> so I'm paying for that permit. <laughs> And we don't worry about it. We can go anywhere we want to within reason, of course, in Everglades National Park. So Joe is an amazing, an amazing instructor. We do, you know, of course, our motto is we simplify the technical. So don't feel like, oh, I don't know anything about photography. Our trips are limited to just five photographers. So you are going to get plenty of help. I just got back from Tuscany a couple of weeks ago, and we had two people who were really, really beginners. And guess what? They weren't by the end of the week. They were shooting in manual. They were blending their photos and they were doing everything. So um, it's a great experience we're, and we'll work with you from where you are. So understandphotography.com is our website. Check it out. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me. I'm truly honored to be on the show. I appreciate it. Well, your work is beautiful and I think everyone's going to really enjoy this interview. Oh, so tell you. us. And tell us your short, the short version of your biography as, as it pertains to photography. <laughs> as it pertains to photography, sure. Uh, grew up in Atlanta, started photography at an early age, age 15. Um, growing up in Atlanta, went to school at the University of Georgia. Studied photography uh, a little bit through college. And then uh, after, right after college, my girlfriend at the time and now wife, uh, we moved out to Denver, Colorado, where we lived mm -hmm. for uh, about 19 years. And we uh, have now moved back east. We're living in Charleston, South Carolina for the past uh, almost three years. Well, two and a half years. Wow. Um, and I, I kind of put photography aside for the past, uh, I guess, 18 years. I've also been a graphic designer. And I think you will probably see some of that reflected in my work. Uh, I have put graphic design on the, on the side burner, if you will. I'm not going to give it up entirely, but I've, I've uh, kind of put it on the side burner for a little bit and I'm now focusing on my, on my fine art. And what's amazing to me is graphic design taught me more about photography than photography ever did. That's interesting. Simple, yeah. Simple things, the way to look at art, uh, uh, simple things like line and shape and form and volume and light. Uh, it taught me about negative space the importance of negative space and how to use it properly and when not to use it. Uh, but I think the most important thing that graphic design taught me about photography was that it's okay 
to create something, not just represent something. Okay. And so my goal with photography has now been completely altered because of graphic design. And now my goal is to create worlds that don't exist or what or whatever. If we think about graphic design for a moment, it's it's um, you start from nothing and you you add a bunch of shapes and forms and and fonts and things together, and all of a sudden you have a concert poster. But you have right? a goal. You have a goal that you're going to make this concert. Absolutely. So you have what? to start with a vision, with a goal. You have to start with an end goal in mind with graphic design. You have to. Okay. What about in photography? With photography. Um, and I, I think we'll probably get into this a little bit more in depth uh, throughout this this podcast and the video cast as well. Um, with photography, you can get a result instantaneously. You have a result instantaneously. And many people stop there. Many That's photographers true. stop there. That but is you don't very have to. true. Yep. So now, you know, so when you were, you know, were you more of a generalist photographer and then how did you get into like minimalism because yeah. you are a minimalist in your photography? Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, I and am going to talk and, about what that is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And even in the, even in my photography that has um, the compositions or the frame, if you will, still filled, I, I would still consider a lot of it minimal approach. Okay. Um, even though the frame might be filled now, you know, many of my, my stuff is very minimal. In fact, <clears throat> that we'll talk about, I think, today more in depth. I think the, the reason that I that I probably got into the minimalist approach is because my earlier works, that was your question, was they it was haphazard. Uh, yeah. I was doc I was documenting things. I was finding my way. Back in my film days, I was still finding my way. I didn't know what I wanted to talk about, what stories that I wanted to tell. Uh, I certainly wasn't working in bodies of work or series, if you will, back then as I am now. Uh, so all of those things became more important to me and more clear to me um, once I got back into photography after my graphic design. Uh, so let me ask you this. Event. So you, you've been making a living as a gra graphic designer and you said, hey, I really miss my photography. Mm -hmm. I want to get back into it. Mm -hmm. um, and you learned a lot more about photography from having a career as a graphic artist. Did you go into photography with the purpose of I'm going to start selling my work as a fine art artist? Or did you just like, oh, I just want to take some pictures? Um, <laughs> or did one lead the to the other? <laughs> no, yeah. I, I would say in the beginning, in my in my early days of, of being, you know, picking up a camera, I, I was just I, I just wanted to be a photographer because of the love of photography at that point. Uh, um, you know, I, I wasn't. I wasn't even thinking about making it a career or any of that kind of stuff. And then the more I went on, you know, through my college years, uh, sure, I, I started kind of thinking that way. And then I shifted into uh, moving pictures and, and ended up getting my degree actually in, in film and video. Okay. Uh, I never made a good career out of film and video. So that's when I fell back on some earlier roots of graphic design. But I would say that uh, my goal now is not necessarily to sell work much to the dismay of some of some people that may know me. Yes. Do I want to sell it? Absolutely. Do I sell it? Yes, I do. And eventually I, I do want to do that, but I'm, I'm focusing on being a career uh, artist. And in order to do that, I have to build myself as an artist first. So my number one goal right now is, is to be an artist, to be my brand, to make okay. my brand. Yeah. And, and let me, I know I want to get into the minimalism. I really do, but I, I'm just interested because, you know, w one of our things here at understand mm -hmm. photography is helping people sell their photography as fine art. Mm -hmm. and it sounds to me like you're using a lot of the, the terminology that we use. You know, a lot, you understand that you need series and you understand that you need a look. And mm -hmm. how did you, how did you learn all this stuff? Um, reading, Listening to shows similar to this, uh, studying the works and the and the not only the works but the the history of other photographers that have been down this road and have made a success, but not just artists or not just photographers, but other artists in general. Because we're if if we're approaching photography as a fine art, 
um, we can look at all kinds of fine art uh, paths of travel that others have taken to get there. And if you look at painters, they don't just make paintings and go right into selling. They paint, they become an artist. They, they become known as an artist. Yep. And I, I think it all stems back to how we start as photographers. And many times we start in photography just because we want to document our travels, let's say. Yeah. Then I think we, that's very we, true. <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. And then we realize as photographers, we're like, hey, well, hang on a minute. I'm, I might be able to make a pretty cool art piece. And then you do. And you learn the technique. And then you start to say, well, I'm, I'm going to start to create a little bit more with vision first. You know, we kind of back, we photographers kind of get, we kind of back into it. Yeah. Into the fine art, pro <laughs> right? It's kind of a, a weird approach. Yeah, I never thought about that, but you're right. <laughs> yeah. And then so once we get there, we're like, okay, uh oh, now I don't know how to now I don't know how to do this properly because we've backed into the path of being a, of making fine art, uh, if if you will. And then we don't know necessarily how to go about it anymore. So I, I think sometimes learning from other types of artists is a good is a good path of travel. I do too. I'm always, if you, if you listen to the show at all, I'm a big proponent of joining your local art association. Agreed. I think you, they, there's a lot of education in those groups. So how did you get into like, how were you attracted to like a minimalist type of photograph or how did you get into that? And, 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 and why don't you explain minimal minimalism in photography to us? Sure. Uh, I, I think uh, minimalism, in its basic form is could be defined as an extreme basically an extreme form of simplicity if you will where the what's not shown is almost more important than what is shown in okay photography so you have a very basic subject matter that's surrounded by an enormous amount of negative space typically and that leaves the viewer or allows the viewer time to think and contemplate space to relax their eyes and think about what's outside of the frame. What's not there, the environment that it's in. I think the reason that I got into it is because, um, it, it all stems essentially from vision. And I think that's important to have, uh, I would say if I'm not creating my own work with vision, I, I don't want to be creating at all. And I believe that uh, it was the it was the minimal photography that I was seeing from other people, minimal types of images that I was seeing from other photographers in the past or or present, for that matter, that intrigued me and it spoke to me. It was a Zen-like approach uh, of peace and calm, and that spoke to me with with uh, what I want what I want to say and portray in my own okay. work. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how, how, like, how, how do you approach a scene or do you go out specifically looking for scenes? How are you, how are you saying, okay, I'm going to take minimalistic <laughs> photographs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's a little bit probably easier here at the coast where I'm living now um, because with long exposure photography, which is one of the techniques that I use, by the use of, of capturing and long exposure, you are removing what I like to call visual clutter with the capture itself. So the water and the sky now become negative space because they're smoothed out to nothingness. Yeah, and that that's just because of, and, and I, we have shows on long exposure. If anybody mm -hmm. needs an explanation on long exposure, you're just keeping your shutter space speed open for a long time so that every, but everything that's not moving or everything that's moving goes blurry and everything that's not moving stays sharp. That's so correct. You have, like pictures of peers yep. and peers or, or uh, maybe signs sticking out of the water or, or breakwaters, uh, breakwater structures, rocks or, or, or poles or any, any of that kind of thing. And then you and get the water so, all smooth and the sky kind of. Soft that's right. So the water completely smooths out to nothingness and the sky is, completely smoothed and so you're left with just the solid structure at that point. Which is, 
And, now and it looks cool. A, <laughs> and now you have, yeah, thank you. And now you have a very minimal <laughs> environment that's calming to look at because all the visual distractions, including the color, because I only produce in black and white, all the visual distractions are now gone. So is that why you, you produce in black and white? Because it, it one of the it reasons. That. Yes, okay. one of the reasons. And is there I, and more, I, are there more? <laughs> yeah, there are. Uh, there are only, I only produce in black and white. And, and one of the reasons is because it's a, it's just one step away from reality, first of all. Uh, and it okay. allows me, black and white allows me a little bit more freedom to create an, a world that doesn't exist. And without being so questioned about it, you know, I, I think we're in a day and age right now where everyone is questioning, you know, is that photoshopped kind of a thing? Has that been post-processed? Yes, absolutely. It has been. <laughs> I'm not hiding. I'm not hiding behind anything, but black and white affords me a little bit more freedom okay. uh, to not be questioned so much, I, let's say, because people okay. know right off the bat. Okay, it's black and white. He's already moving away from reality. So the things that I do further to move away from reality are accepted. That's I, you know what? I never thought about that, but that is so true because there was a you know, we just got back from a trip to Tuscany and I met his name is Stefano Caporali. I met him there. I hired him. You know, I found him on the internet. Would you take me on a tour, a photo tour while I, while I was in Tuscany a few years mm -hmm. ago? And he was so good. So we did a photo tour with him as our main guide. But I kept thinking, well, when I get there, I'm going to learn how he processes his pictures because his pictures are so amazing. You're right. It just, I never even realized I was thinking that. When I look at his pictures, I think, I wonder how he's processing them because they look so mm -hmm. amazing. And I never did learn, by the way. <laughs> oh, I guess, yeah. But I guess you're right. You wouldn't even question it on a black and white. You know that some kind of processing is happening. So. That's interesting. I never yeah. realized I questioned it. I think that uh, we're in a day and age now where uh, with film photography, we never questioned it. If things were done, if things happened in post-production, it was just never questioned. And, and for whatever reason, we have a, a whole camp of people, if you will, that are what I like to call the straight out of camera gurus. They don't want things to happen at all in post-production. They, you know, maybe a bump of an exposure slider or whatever. And that's fine if that's what fulfills uh, fulfills their desire of, of photography. That's great, but it's never been enough for me. That's not going to ever yeah. be enough for me. And and I think maybe it's because we've had so many bad attempts at Photoshop. Let's say I, I don't know why this this um, mentality exists now. The straight out of camera uh, approach exists now, but it does more so now than ever. I believe. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I'm I'm not. It's funny because I am kind of a straight out of camera photographer, but I'm not a purist at all. I don't, I yeah. like, I always like with Stefano, I wanted to know how he was processing. I'm like, I want to copy that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but part of the problem is I don't have the patience to sit on Photoshop. You know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm good I like at Photoshop. Say, I've been using it for 20 years, but I, yeah. I don't like to sit at the computer. I, I like to say that you will never see, what you see in my imagery, you will never see by visiting those same locations. You just won't. Okay. You will only see them by visiting me. So how do you choose a location? How do you, you know, tell me, tell me your process. Mm -hmm. uh, I will start typically um, on Google. I'll do a lot of Google scouting and Google okay. Earth satellite view. That's a great way to do some preliminary scouting. If it's in my local area and I can go there and do some physical scouting, I will. And I, I'm a big advocate of scouting my locations okay. without okay. my equipment. And I go without equipment. Ooh. I'll go with my phone in hand only to, to, to document where I am and to make sure that um, the angles are what I want and, and that kind of a thing. Now, obviously, if you're traveling, you can't, you're not afforded the freedom to scout like that. But if right. you can... What happens is that was one of the biggest things that helped slow me down in the field. You think the other way around because it's counterintuitive, but what happens is when you scout, you've already picked your locations. You've already picked the X marks, the spot for the given angle. And you've, you've maybe checked it out in, a couple times in given light situations. So when you go there, 
when the sky is set up, let's say I'm going to shoot a, let's say I'm going to photograph a building or a bridge. And so now I'm just, I've scouted it. Now I'm just waiting on the skies on a day for the skies to set up properly. So I know that the long exposure is going to give me what I'm after. Okay. And then when I, when I go back, I'm not hurried to get around the corner because, oh wait, there may be a better angle around the corner. Because I know there's already... not a, I, okay. yeah, I know there's not a better angle there. I've already yeah. scouted it. So now I can slow down and breathe and work on that particular shot that I okay. want there to get. I do the work and then I go home. So when you're scouting on, let's say, Google Earth, what are you looking for? Uh, typically, I'm looking for some angles or some backgrounds. So I'll do, you can get street views on a lot of those things, a lot of places. Obviously, if, I, if I'm scouting somewhere at the beach, I'm not getting a street view, of course. But mm -hmm. I'm looking for uh, what may be in the background or if I'm looking for a, a certain structure. Now let's move to the coast, for example. If I'm looking for something reaching out into the sea, a breakwater structure, for example, a pile of rocks that they that they build, those uh, okay. they call them groins, you know, that reach out into the ocean to help help keep the uh, beach erosion from happening. Okay. I'm, I'm looking for um, just a couple of those in, in, in a good angle to the sun or a good angle to the light. Okay. Sunrise or sunset. Now, I like to work on cloudy days a lot, so sometimes that doesn't necessarily matter, the sunrise or sunset, the golden hour, if you will, doesn't necessarily matter to me as much. Yeah, especially if you're putting it in mm -hmm. black and white and it's cloudy. Yeah, that would, that would make sense. Yeah. So, <clears throat> how when you're talking about the light if you're just taking mm -hmm. something you want the light on your subject basically most of the time or yeah most of the time or if it's a you know I just want to make sure that I'm I can avoid uh, major hard shadows if I'm if I'm wanting a minimal image typically you want to have a much more soft light approach so I need to oh. avoid any major hard shadows so uh, minimal photography typically works better I, I think for me anyway with a, a really soft light Okay, so the clouds help. Yeah, absolutely. Really overcast day. And uh, overcast days are also really great when you're photographing uh, buildings that are glass and steel because then your glass windows are featureless reflections. Ah. Now, you can get a featureless reflection on a clear sky day, a blue sky day. Uh -huh. You'll have a featureless reflection in the, in the windows, but you're plagued with hard shadows and specular highlights. Okay. So a really overcast day for architecture is also really good. A white sky, I like to call it a white sky day. Yeah. And then I and then I handle the sky, the post production, the sky. I'll handle that and post, um, you know, and darken it down and and do like a sky glow or whatever kind of treatment I'm going to do in post. Do you but swap the, out the skies sometimes? I, I have, and I have nothing wrong with that. I would much rather capture a sky organically if I can. Uh huh. But if I'm traveling and the skies don't play nice for me, then absolutely. <laughs> if, if it doesn't fit the vision that I'm after, then I will absolutely uh, do a sky composite. Yeah. Now, do you use certain apps like on your computer or on your phone that tell you lighting and weather? and? Yeah. Uh, occasionally, I'll use uh, photo pills, okay. um, you know, to get the angle of light. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a pretty good, that's a pretty good app. But other than that, I'm, I'm, I'll just rely on the weather, on the basic weather apps. Okay. You, know, I, you know, I'll use okay. the iPhone weather app or Accu weather or whatever to get to get that kind of thing. Sure. And then down here at the coast, I have to, <laughs> when I moved here, I didn't didn't realize this at first, but I have to start studying tides as well, because a lot of these structures that are reaching out into the water are not in the water all the time. So I have to wait for a certain tide height. That also helps with scouting. So I'll go scout and I'll say, okay, what's the tide right now? Now I have to find when the tide is going to be at that level and at the right light. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So and there's so a, do, is, so do, is that an app or? Yep. The tides, so you just, or? yep. Yeah. You, there's, there's a couple tide apps that you can get. Hang on one second. Just lost my headphones. Uh, yeah. There's a couple tide apps that you can get. And I, I just use a, a pretty basic free tide app that just gives me a tide table. That's all I'm after is the tide table. And then yeah. I'll couple that with the weather app. Sure. It's funny because I, there's um, a few photographers here in my area who have photographed this. I don't even know what it is. It's like this, <clears throat> I think it's metal. It's like a, 
zigzaggy thing in the water and they usually do with a real long exposure and mm -hmm. it's so cool and I've lived here for 26 or 27 years and I have I never ever they're like it's right in Port Royal you know just down by the end of the whatever and I've never seen it so I started walking every day a year a little over a year ago I started walking every day with a friend of mine and then on the weekends we usually go to the beach and I finally saw it but it was super low tide. <laughs> oh. So I was like, oh, I have to go. I have not yet photographed it except with my cell phone. But uh, I started like doing Google search on how do I find out when it's low tide? And it, you were right, it was easy. It was easy to find that out. So I mean, I don't yeah, know yeah, if sure. it's an app or a website I was, but I, it was pretty easy to find out. Oh yeah, I just, oh, yeah. I just you can definitely find out what the yet. tides are. And, and I just keep it on my phone. So if I'm somewhere and I see a structure, and it's perfectly in the water how I would want how I would want to photograph it. I quickly just pull up my app and pull up the nearest tide station, and it may or may not be right there. So the tide station could be a mile away, but it's going to be close enough. And I'll just pull up my app real quick and and look. Okay, uh, what's the time of day? And then what's the level of the tide right now? And then I'll just make a mental note of that or jot it down in my in my notes, my scouting notes that I keep as well. Oh. And then I'll say, okay, I, I, I want to be there at that at that tide height. Now I just need to get that tide height at the right time of day or the right right weather conditions, and then get those two to to marry up, and then okay. make it happen. And yeah. how? I mean, is this your full time <laughs> job? I mean, how do you just say, okay, well, the, it's going to be cloudy and the tide's right, so I'm going yeah. out. <laughs> It I is. mean, that seems hard to do. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. And I, and I kind of wanted to touch on that too. My, my wife and I decided I, I, we, I put graphic design on the, on the side burner. I'm never going to stop doing it, but I'm not actively seeking new clients, if you will. Uh -huh. My wife and I decided together a few years ago that uh, let's, let's uh, attack this um, full course and see if we can make it work. And, and uh, we knew, we, we both knew and, and uh, going in that, there's not going to be a lot of money right away <clears throat> and we're okay with that. And she's extremely supportive, 100% on board with me. And so, yes, this is my full-time job photography and I'm teaching and, and doing some workshops from time to time, one-to-one -one, uh, training type of things. Okay. But the number one goal is to, is to make art right now. Okay. And um, I have the luxury of having some support, a very supportive spouse, and we can we can handle it. We can get by. We can eke by financially <laughs> on it. Um, but without her support, I absolutely would not be able to do to make the art that I am right now. Yeah, yeah. I know we're going to have more shows on how to get grants and things like that. We have some already, but that's something yeah. that I want to start talking about because a lot of ways. Was, yeah, and grants um, and patrons and uh, sponsors and all that kind of stuff. There are there are definitely uh, artists throughout history have always had to rely on patrons. I know. Always. I know. And that's something I think a lot of people need to get past that as a mindset that they don't want to, but okay. So let's, so are like, is everything you do long exposures? Like when you're doing the buildings and that, <clears throat> and that kind of stuff too? No, no, not always. Um, I, I think uh, to back up a little bit, I think one of the things one of the things that was always missing to me in my early photography was was one that I wasn't creating with vision. I wasn't approaching my work with a with an established vision of okay. what I wanted to say. So that was one thing that was missing. The second thing that was missing was I, I wasn't and I wasn't able to create a world that existed from within my comic book world, if you will. Uh, ethereal, surrealistic, some people call it otherworldly. I like to call it, you know, somewhat comic book, frankly. <laughs> uh, it, it's not a real world and I'm not trying to make it a real world. It's a world that exists from within and I, and I try to bring that to life to show other people, hey, this is my world. Wouldn't it be cool to see this? Wouldn't it be really cool to step outside and see this? Um, and long exposure was one of the many things that was also missing from my photography in my early days. And that method of capture enables me to take yet another step away from reality and bring that ethereal minimalistic style. So yes, I am driven to capture in long exposure often. Okay. Uh, more often than not, but I'm not always capturing that way. 
Let me ask you, how, I mean, you keep talking about vision, and that's one of those yeah. terms that's kind of hard to explain. Mm -hmm. You want to give it a shot? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I actually give a, I, I've, I've given this presentation now a half dozen times or more, and I just gave it up in um, a keynote. I was a keynote speaker up in Harrisburg at the Harrisburg Camera Club. They, they put on an entire symposium, full day. Four wow. speakers from all over the nation come in. They, I was so honored that they brought me in to be a keynote speaker. And the topic, my topic uh, was on vision, and it's called Vision, A World Created, Not Captured. Vision, uh, there isn't a really good definition for it per se. So yeah. I've kind of come up with my own, and it's hokey, I know. But basically, it's, a, it's an outward expression of an inner feeling or emotion. That's okay. what vision is an outward expression of an inner feeling or emotion. Don't confuse that now with pre-visualization. Okay. That's what Ansel Adams would talk about all the time. He was pre-visualizing. That has to do with the resulting aesthetic of the photograph. That's what pre-visualization is all about. And that's important to have also. You need to be able to pre-visualize what the outcome is going to be so that you know how you want to capture it in the field. Okay. Knowing, how, okay. knowing how you're going to post-process it when you get home. That is a learning and growing ladder that you climb. You, you learn what you can do in post, and you take that knowledge to the field, and you capture a little different because you know what you're going to do in post. And then you say, well, I'm going to try something else a little different even in the field, so I'm going to try something in post, and you climb this ladder back and forth. Okay. Okay. But vision, but vision is basically the storytelling and the and the vision has to do with the artist, not with the photograph. So the vision of the of the piece of work has to do with what the artist is trying to say. So what are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> So it, it, well, it depends on the series that I'm working on. For example, um, there's a, one of my series titled Fourth Rock, uh, as in the fourth rock from the sun, the fourth planet from the sun. Okay. Uh, when I was driving through Utah many years ago, I remember thinking to myself, first of all, I'd never been through Utah. And if you haven't been, put it on your bucket list. Okay. When I was driving through Utah, it was remarkable to me how Martian it is. It's a very <laughs> Martian landscape. So I said, if I ever get back here to, to do a photography trip, my goal is going to be to present it in an otherworldly fashion. That is my vision. And so I did go back to Moab, to the Moab area, and did arches and canyon lands and all the stuff that's near Moab. And my series of work, uh, my body of work on, that you can see on my website, titled Fourth Rock, that is in an, F, in an effort to bring the vision of the fourth rock from our sun, Mars, to life, but not Mars as it exists today. Mars as it exists, like, let's say, way in the future when man has somehow gotten there and terraformed the planet. We have weird plant life growing and a strange atmosphere is beginning to form. And that's the goal of that series. That's the vision of that okay. series. Okay. Mm -hmm. That that's cool. That is really cool. So it's all in an it's all in an effort to tell just a story that exists within me, I suppose. That's awesome. That's I'm not that's something I struggle with. I it's funny. I I think I'm I'm not left brain or right brain. I'm kind of in the middle, so I have to learn everything. <laughs> Things sure. but I think creativity can be learned. I really Absolutely. Do. Uh, one of the things I, I mentioned in my in my presentation in my talk uh, is that um, I will ask people say it, you hear it all the time. I'm, I don't have a creative bone in my body, right? We hear that all the time from people. Well, ask them if they dream. To which they will say, "Of course I dream." And if you're anything like me, your dreams are out in left field. Yeah. Bizarre, <laughs> border like they're borderline psychotic. Exactly. <laughs> you were to have these dreams in your waking hours, probably should see someone about it, right? <laughs> that's, your that's your creative side. We all have it. Everyone has a creative side. I'm not putting those thoughts in your mind. You are. Yeah. It's learning to get in touch with that during the waking hours. That's the difficult part for some people. Yeah. That's the difficult part. But it's something that you can exercise. And, you know, one kids, of the things. All a couple kids have it. 
All kids have it. Yes. Think about it. Think about playtime when you were a kid, the make-believe stuff you did as a kid. And then when we become adults, we lose touch with that. But we all had it as kids. We've just lost yeah. it. That is so yeah. true. That is so true. All right. So um, how much do you manipulate? You know, you said you're not a purist. You're not a, you know, you no. want this visual. How, how, like, if you have, you come home, you look through your pictures, you say, mm -hmm. I'm going to work on this one. Mm -hmm. How much are you doing to it? Uh, it depends on the image, really. Some of my seascape images are not manipulated that much. Uh, the light is manipulated, uh, certainly, but other things are not manipulated that much. Uh, some of my architecture buildings and bridges are heavily manipulated. 20, 30, 40 hours worth of work in wow. post. Uh, and what and are, that you, what all, are you doing for 30 yeah, hours? <laughs> a lot of that is making the selections around each individual surface in the image so that I can process the light on each each separate surface of let's say a bridge or a building without affecting the other surfaces. Okay. So the side of a building or even the window ledges of a building would be, would be processed individually. The and when light, you may, when you say you're manipulating the light, what are you doing? Darkening and lighting, lightning. Exactly. It? It's just a very, dodging controlled, and burning. Yep, okay. very controlled dodging and burning. Very, very controlled okay. dodging and burning. It's, it's uh, with layer masking and, all kinds of other techniques where I can um, use an overexposed layer and then mask in that the light from that layer okay. into that into the image. And I'm kind of looking around at some of my images right now to to, to help explain that. Are uh, you taking things like if you're doing architectural things? Are you taking like removing, distracting? Yes. Stuff. <laughs> I yes. Get that if stuff. It's, <laughs> if, it's, if it's distracting, get it out of there. If, okay. if you can get it out of there or if you can downplay it by darkening. So maybe it doesn't have to come out, but maybe you just downplay that section of the image by darkening it. And uh, if you were to see some of my before and after images, um, you would you would see that not everything is necessarily removed. It's just very downplayed because it's so dark and low key in that area. And then I've, I've brightened up, significantly brightened up other areas where I want the eye to go. And so that's where your eye does go. Ah. So and that's yeah, all, you know, your, your, this is all your education in graphics too, because our, in yep. composition, our eye is attracted to the lightest part of the picture. Sure. And, and, yeah. uh, and that kind of, the, the pre-visualization that I mentioned earlier, that's why that can be so important in the field, knowing what you're going to do in post-processing. Because if you were to see some of my compositions straight out of camera, they would look terrible. Compositionally, <sighs> compositionally, they could look terrible, but that's because I haven't laid the light on them yet. Oh. Once I lay the light, the composition then comes together. So that pre-visualization in the field is very important, knowing what I'm going to do in post with it. So what, what tools are you using to lay the light? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, everything, <laughs> everything starts for me in Photoshop. So I will optimize, I mean, excuse me, in Lightroom, I will optimize the raw file, the raw capture in Lightroom, just optimizing, meaning uh, any lens corrections, uh, if I need to straighten verticals, uh, exposure, contrast, all those basic adjustments that we do just to make the raw file the best it can be. Okay. Then it goes into, that's all that happens in Lightroom, aside from file management, of course. Then it goes into Photoshop where I will I will use uh, usually Nick Silver effects to do the conversion to black and white. And I'll do several different conversion layers, low key, high key, normal, all those that will then be used to pull the light in. But then and, in Photoshop, that's when I'm masking in the light, layer masking in the light and from so, those other layers. Okay, so the Nick, Nick filters are uh, filters that now you can buy. They used to be... Yep. They used to be expensive, then they were free, and now you yep. have to buy them again, but they're not expensive anymore. I don't think no. they're 50 bucks or something like that. For yeah, I don't know what the price is. D expensive. Yeah, DxO is, it owns them now. Owns and those. it's NIK, if people aren't familiar with them. Mm -hmm. And the silver effects is specifically different, almost like filters for different looks in black and white. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes and no. Silver Effects is a remarkable tool that can mimic certain films, actually. Like if okay. you had a favorite, if you were shooting in the film day and you had a favorite film, you can actually mimic that look. And then on the when you go into Nick for the first time, you'll see on the left-hand side, there will be 
a whole slew of presets. Now all those presets can be obtained by manipulating the sliders on the right hand side, of course. But yes, it's a, it's a wonderful black and white conversion software that can give you pretty quick conversions. But you can also um, just do black and white conversions in Photoshop. Don't do it by just desaturating, though. That's the that's a terrible way to get to black and white. Desaturate. Okay. Yeah, you need to, there there are much better ways. But that's for another day. That topic. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's but let me just ask time. you one more thing about the Nick filters. Is there a, sure. a big learning curve on the Nick filters if someone's interested in them? I don't think so. I think Nick is uh, very user friendly. Frankly, uh, it's it operates similar to Lightroom in that there's sliders that you can just push and pull and and get a result until you like it. You can start with presets and get a result that you like uh, immediately. So I think uh, Silver Effects is a great way to go. Okay, so easy. you, mm -hmm. so when you say you're, you're, um, I forgot, layering the light, mm -hmm. so you're doing separate layers in the Nick with different looks and then masking them out? How are you, laying? I still am not clear on yeah, how you're yeah, doing okay. the light in Photoshop, I guess. Are you using like dodge tool? Are you using levels, curves? Uh, so I'll have, let's say I have a very underexposed black and white conversion. Let's say I call it a low key conversion. I'll have multiple black and white conversions that I've done in Photoshop. So each of those conversions are stacked on top of one another and layers. And then I will add a mask to, let's say, the underexposed layer and bring in the light from the overexposed layer and mask okay, that in. I see. Okay. It's, uh, it's something that's very difficult to explain in language other than actually physically yeah. showing. Yeah. But it's like that's the way we used to do HDR photography before they started Similar. making all these cool softwares that just blend yeah. everything for you. But exactly. we used to just use layer masks and just... Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how similar, you're doing it. Similar approach. Okay. Sure. Yep. Similar approach. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Stefano was big into that too when we were in Tuscany. That was kind of his approach too. He really liked the layer masks. And yep. shameless plug, by the way, you know, we sell um, online photography classes for Photoshop and Photoshop elements that oh. teach you how to use layer masks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> no, no. That's, that's so now are you, when you're, I'm going to go back to shooting. Are, yes. are you using, you must be using filters, right? To Absolutely. Darken. Do you yep. have a favorite type of filter? or? I use, um, I'm typically on a 16 stop filter if, if, if I'm in the middle of the day so that I can wow. get the five, five minute long exposures. Um, so I'm using a 16 stop filter. I'm, I'm um, uh, sponsored and supported by Wine Country Camera. They make a filter holder system and filters. Uh, they're based out of California. Go figure. Wine Country Camera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they can be found at winecountry.camera. Oh, uh, that's they, cute. <laughs> yeah, winecountry.camera. So their filter holder. I like that. Is, uh, the wine and the camera together. That's kind yeah, of yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Their filters are uh, wonderful filters. And so I have to use, um, I absolutely have to use pretty heavy ND filters, neutral density filters, so that I can block enough light to get the longer exposures in the middle of the day. I didn't even know they make six. Do they make 16 stop filters or are you yeah. stacking them? You can stack. I don't recommend it necessarily, but that's a good way to start. If you, uh, if you want to save some money, uh, because that, that can get expensive. Um, and you can absolutely stack a 10 and a six together or what, whatever you would need, whatever. And stop. Why, why don't you recommend it? Uh, because it's more glass for the light to pass through. So mm -hmm. I, I like to eliminate, I, I want the light to pass through as little glass as possible before reaching my lens. Okay. And so they make a 16 stop. They actually make an 18 and a 20 and a 22 stop filter. So how do you take a picture like that? Do you, you have to focus before? Yep. Everything has to happen. On? Focusing, composition, everything has to happen before the filter goes on. And then you have to turn off every all auto stuff off auto focus has to come off auto exposure all the auto stuff on your camera has to be turned off of course and then you have to do the math to figure out the the equivalent long exposure time from the base shutter speed do you do the math or do you have an app i can do it in my head but i use an app it's much quicker <laughs> what's what what's the app uh the one that i use is is called uh l-e-x-p l-e-x-p but okay. if you just put long exposure calculator 
into uh-huh. your app store search, it will re- it will return a dozen, and they all do the same thing. They all do the same thing. So you can say, so you're without the filter. Let's say mm-hmm. you're at ISO 100, F11, mm-hmm. and a shutter speed of 100, and you meter, and you're taking a picture of a pier, and you mm-hmm. meter, and that's where you're metered to zero. Mm-hmm. So then yes. you put the filter on, and it's pitch black. But you yep. can put those, you put those numbers into the calculator. Yep. Really, and, all that you need to put in is the uh, is the shutter speed 100. Because oh. if you leave if you leave ISO and aperture the same, uh-huh. it's only the shutter speed that's that needs to change. That's okay. It. Okay. All right. And so, if you say I want to do, well, how do you know what you want? How how do you know how long you want it? Well, that with experience. Um, okay. You, you have to learn with with experience, but. The basic rules of thumb, if, if there should be a rule of thumb, and I, I don't think there should be, but let's just say mm-hmm. there is. Um, one minute will be plenty of time to smooth out most water. One minute will smooth out most flat water. Two seconds or one second even will smooth out a waterfall. So there's a drastic difference there in, in the length of time that, need, that you need from one type of water to the next type of water. Now, skies need about five minutes. Some skies um. need even as much as eight minutes because clouds move frankly, kind of slow. Uh, now, there are days where clouds are really booking it, and you can get by with, you know, two-minute exposure, and you'll get a nice streaky sky, but typically, you need a much longer exposure to get a sky that looks good. Okay, so so when I'm saying my shutter speed is 100, and I'm going to put a 10-stop filter, you just say 10-stop filter, and it will do the math. Yep, it does the math. For yep. you, and mm-hmm. so you know what to put your shutter speed on, That's but right. the way you're going to know which 10-stop or 16-stop is by what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, and that the length just of, mostly comes from experience. That's right. That's yeah, what you're saying. Yep. But you so know if you're doing clouds, you're going to want your 16 stop, especially if it's in the middle of the day, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. You, you know that I know that I want, <clears throat> excuse me, five minutes roughly. <clears throat> so I would just back into it with my app. I would say, okay, what's going to give me five minutes? What filter at this base shutter speed will yield five minutes roughly? Okay. And then I back into it. Yeah. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not that experienced with long expo- exposures. I got filters for Christmas last year, and I've only been out, I've only used them a few times because life is busy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the, the I'm, I'm trying to think of the composition. That's the word I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Composition and design and how do you, like, are you thinking about the compositional rules on where to place your subject, or how does that? How do you? Oh, sure. how, do you how do you work a scene? Yeah, uh, sure. Sometimes I I, I I do abide by the rules, if you will. Uh, sometimes and, and many times I break them uh, on purpose. And I think when you learn the rules and learn how to to use them and to your to your advantage, that's when you learn when to break them as well. So, you know, sometimes you can center things and they look great centered. Other times you should not. But yeah, I, I, composition has always come fairly easy to me. I, I, I hate to say, I don't, I don't mean to sound um, cocky or egotistical or anything, but composition is not something I've ever really thought. Uh, I don't have to think about too much. I look through the camera and I, I, I'm in square format and I can just, I just see it and it just looks good and I, and I, and I go with it. Okay. Uh, but I, but I do think about it of course. I mean, I am I am conscious of it. And if I'm if you're centering something, if you're trying to make something symmetrical like with uh, buildings, I encourage people to really slow down at that point because if you're not if you're trying to make something symmetrical and you don't nail it, then you will absolutely notice it. When you print it and hang it on the wall, it will drive you crazy. Okay. If it's not perfectly symmetrical, and then it'll drive you crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, I, I, I like to think there's no perfect, you know, perfect doesn't exist, but you should be precise about it. You should be precise about it. So when you're talking about negative space, mm-hmm. how much space mm-hmm. are you talking about? I mean, do you, or does it vary? It could be a ton. Uh, some of my photography that has uh, negative space in it will have 95% of the image is negative space. Wow. So very, very little. And then other negative space can be, you know, um, 50-50 kind of a thing. Yeah. I would think, though, the more negative space, the more important 
the composition rules would be. Maybe I'm Can wrong. Be. No, I'm I just think thinking you're right. if you have just one little tiny uh, wooden thing sticking out of the water, it almost yeah. has to be in a PowerPoint, I would think. I don't know. Am I right? You can, uh, you can make it work dead nut center. Um, but yeah, you know, the rule of thirds is a really powerful uh, compositional rule to, to go with on that kind of stuff, especially if you're just starting out with minimal photography. By all means, you know, lean on those rules. They're there for a reason. Uh, you know, they, they exist in, in art. And not just photography, by the way, that those rules have existed in art since the day that art started. And uh, they, they're there for a reason. They work. Once you learn them and you can learn to break them to your advantage, then do so. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what, what, are we, what are we missing? What do we need to talk about for our last few here. minutes? Yeah. Let's see here. I'll, uh, I'll roll through my own notes here for a second because <laughs> <laughs> that took some as well. Um, Let's see, we talked about uh, the technique and how I use the light, how I manipulate um, sell, the fact that selling the work for me is, you know, that second, that's coming second. But vision you know, is that, I just want to touch on that important. a little bit. Yeah, let's, let's do, sure. Just about, just for a second, but we have a, sure. we've got, we have a couple shows from different people talking about how do you, you have to build your reputation as an artist Mm -hmm. if you want to sell your art for a decent amount of money. And it's yeah. so important. And you seem to really understand that. Yeah. Because if you just, you know, the fastest way to sell your artwork is just go to an art fair. People will mm -hmm. see it. It's pretty. They buy it. But you're never going to get a lot of money that way. You're never going to be mean, renowned. I shouldn't say never. That could be a well, step. You've established yourself as an art fair photographer at that point, an art fair artist at that point. And it's hard to break free from that. That's, yes. that's the problem. I, I think that it's hard. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of art fair artists that love doing the art fairs and that's great. They love that. That's an environment that they thrive in. They love yeah, being and you there. You can make they, a lot of money. You can. You really you can. can. You can make you absolutely you know, can. 20, 30 grand a weekend. You really can. Yep. Uh, if you're um, professional, it's, super it's not professional. What I, it. It's not what I want to do. Uh, and frankly, my limited editions are too small that would even allow me to do an art fair. I don't, I can't have enough um, bin work, if you will. Let me ask you this. What do you think is a good limited edition number? What do you think is, what, what makes, Ooh. what makes a good is limited? Is that a good number? question? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? I'd like to hear well, your thoughts I, on I that. Limit, I limit my, my prints are limited at seven. Okay. And, so you can charge more money. That's one of in one of our classes. Yeah. So you can charge mm -hmm. the the fewer choices for the yep. patron, the more money you can charge because they know only seven people are going to have that image, right? Exclusivity, exclusivity, right? And and I don't, I'm not limiting by size, by the way. So the next print off the line, no matter what size it is, is the next number in line. That's awesome. So yeah, some people to will me limit that's by a little size. And to me, that's a little deceptive. I somewhat agree because what's to say that if you're limiting by size and you run, let's say you run out of all your sizes, what's to say that you're not going to just create another size? Exactly. I totally right. agree with that. I totally agree and, with and, that. Yeah. And the answer, the answer should be if anyone were to, if anyone is doing, if there is any artist out there that's listening to this, that is doing that currently, that is, that is working with uh, limited editions per size. And if, someone ever were to ask them what's to keep you from creating another size the answer should be one word ethics and that yeah. will shut them up just say yeah. ethics and that will okay. shut almost anyone up yeah because that's the, the the truth is if we don't have ethics then we shouldn't be selling our work we need to have ethics that's good all right finish your little rundown see what else we need to talk about or, uh, or do you want to just kind of go th through some tips We'll close yeah, it sure. up with some tips. Yeah, we can we can close up with some tips too. Uh, there was something I, I felt like there was something more that I wanted to touch on with vision. Um, I can't quite remember what it is now. Um, so we'll just let that we'll just let that be, I suppose. Um, I think you had asked uh, Heather had sent me the you know the the list. She's awesome, by the way. Um, I she's agree. The list of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I sent me the list of things, and I, I think. I, one of the one of the tips I think for creating a minimal image, I think number one is just to slow down. Slow down in the field. 
why did you get into photography in the first place? And it's because you love being outdoors. So stop flinging from the hip so often and just slow down and enjoy, enjoy your place and time. And I think the minimals will come to you because you'll start to see the simple, small things. Um, the number two is to pick simple, ordinary subject matter and isolate it in its own environment. Because it's simple, it can still be beautiful if it's isolated. Yep. Long exposures will help eliminate the other visual clutters that we talked about, such as the movement of the water and the sky. Okay. And you can, and then uh, number four would be either crop in to eliminate its surroundings or widen way up so that you include a ton of sky or negative space like that. And that will help make a minimal. And then when you're processing, if you're processing in black and white, if you're processing in black and white, very smooth tonal transitions are important for minimal photography, I think. Okay. Uh, so nothing is too abrupt. You know, no transitions are too abrupt. And that helps uh, give a more zen uh, feeling to me, I think, typically. And you said that about the lighting as well. Yeah, about the lighting soft as well. Soft lighting, too. Yep, exactly. Soft lighting, soft transitions on everything. And here's something that I think a lot of people miss. Uh, if you're trying to create fine art photography, first of all, fine art is about the artist. Um, anything fine art is about the artist, first and foremost. Second, keep in mind that just because you're creating quote unquote fine art photography, that's a look, I suppose. It's not really fine art until, you, until it becomes tangible. So printing, you have to print. And if you're going to print and you're going to make fine art, then there are two more things that are very important and one, and they're overlooked. And image titling is the number one thing. You need to title Ooh. your images and they need to be, they, the title needs to, to say something that's emotional about the image, about you as an artist. And it can't just be stick in water, you know, or, <laughs> you know, tree in the redwood forest or whatever. It needs to be an emotional type of title because especially with a minimal photo piece of artwork, some, a minimal photography piece, that title will help your viewer understand what it is that you are trying to say about it. And then they can daydream and come up with their own conclusions and their own story or whatever from there. From, but that title is a kicking off point for them. And then the artist statement is also extremely important for fine art photography. And if you're working in series and bodies of work, let's say, uh -huh. then the artist statement would be for the body of work, not each individual image. It would be for the body of work. So it's a little easier, I guess, to write an artist statement when it comes to that. Okay. Yeah, so that ties it all together. The image title, the image itself, and then the artist statement. Everything is now tied together as one whole unit. Awesome. I love that. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you. What, no, so tell me what's coming up for you. What's coming up next? Okay, so uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm continuing to, to market my work and that kind of thing. Workshop season is beginning to slow down. So now I can kind of get back to creating my own work. You know, over the summer, I'm pretty busy with, with uh, teaching and doing one-to-one -one stuff, which I love by the way, but it, it's a balancing act kind of. So I, you know, when I'm teaching, I'm not really able to produce a whole lot of my own work. So now I'm getting to the point where I can kind of get, you start going through my backlog of images <laughs> and get back to making my own art. So that's really what's coming up for me at this point. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. And where can, where can our audience find you? Uh, they can find me uh, on my website, which is Kevin holiday photo.com. And remember that holiday is two L's. So Kevin H O L L I D A Y photo P H O T O.com. And then on Facebook and Instagram, both at the handle of Kevin holiday photo. Oh, well, that, you made it easy. easy. Keep it easy simple. Ever. Kevin Holiday, <laughs> add a .com or just put it in as the handle and there you go. Yep. You'll find, you'll find you. And you're yep, located exactly. in, in South Carolina, you said. I'm in, yeah, I'm in Charleston right now. Charleston, yeah. how beautiful. What a great place. Very photographically, um, there's a ton of photographic inspiration in this town. Oh, no doubt that's about awesome. It. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate oh it. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. It was uh, great to chat with you. 
Well, thank you, Kevin. That was a lot of information, and and uh, you're definitely coming back on the show. I want to hear more from you. You have a lot of insight, and I think uh, I think our audience is going to get a lot out of this show. Thank you for watching the Understand Photography show. Next week, Joe Fitzpatrick is going to be back on, and you know he's a great guest. The guy is so full of knowledge. We're going to be talking about cataloging your images. Now, Joe is a Lightroom expert, but we're going to talk about some other uh, ways to catalog and sort and keep track of your images as well. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching the Understand Photography show. We'll see you next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, either on the podcast, YouTube, or Facebook. Yeah.